Well, good afternoon. Thanks very much, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, I'm pretty sure you came to, to challenge me that modern and C++ cannot be in the same sentence, but I'm going to try to prove you otherwise. So first, let me introduce myself. I am Diego, and together with my colleague Luis, we are the, the founders of Conan, Package Manager, and we joined J, uh, JFrog uh, a while ago. So first, I'm going to introduce briefly a bit of about the challenges to, to do modern DevOps in C and C++ projects. Then I'm going to introduce some solutions, and I will finish with the conclusions. So first, I would like to provide a small guide to how to choose a proper language to develop a, a new project. So if we want to, to make a new project, we, we could choose such a, an ugly and unreadable Python syntax, for example. Or maybe we, we could do a, a bit better and, and go for Java and provide some, ty some types. Uh, still very ugly and unreadable. So I would suggest go for something very readable, compact and clear, like this elegant C++ syntax. Yeah, so uh, for sure I'm trolling you. Actually, C++ is a beautiful language. It is, the, I think, the only one that provides true generics, like this example here, with zero cost. And no garbage collector, really the best performance you can have with memory safety using the STL and things like that, and a very readable syntax. So this is beautiful. Uh, and we have a standard committee doing a great job with the C++ 11, 14, and 17 standards. C++ is a loved language used in many critical industries in gaming, financial, uh, embedded, automotive, and so on. And it's very big. There are more like uh, 4 million developers in the world uh, together C and C++, which might be bigger than even the Java community. So this is a uh, huge. So the, the problem with C++ is not the language itself. It is mostly the dev tools and build tools. Actually, they are a bubble tower of build systems that, for example, make us, we have to develop multi-platform and we have to, to deal with different platform APIs. And we have to do things like this to our beautiful code that is not very readable, but it's more okay and we can deal with it. The real problem for me is that we have very different build systems and very different compilers. They won't be compatible, some uh, C++ or C features, they won't be compatible, they won't work in all co compilers, and we will have different build systems that work very differently in different operating systems. Actually, we, we have even meta build systems like CMake that will generate build systems uh, in, a, in a portable way. So, and the big problem with these compilers is that we have the ABI compatibility or incompatibility problem. That is a, is a huge pain because you can generate binaries and those binaries won't be uh, reusable in different settings. Of course, you know that if you generate a binary in Windows, it's not going to be uh, usable in Linux. But the problem is that the, if you use a compiler and a compiler version and you generate a binary, it won't be compatible with an, another binary generated with just a different version of the same compiler. And this is a pain. And it's not only the compiler version, but also subtle things like the build type. So typically in Windows Visual Studio, you have debug and release build types. Uh, you can link, probably you can link an artifact build with a debug type from release, and it will link, and it will not complain. So probably you get a warning. And then you have a segmentation fault at, at runtime that is very difficult to debug and, and it's a pain. Or you can have in the GCC world, you, you will have incompatibilities with the standard C++ library. And you will have from, from GCC 5.1, you have the libstdc++11. Uh, okay, that is incompatible with the old libstdc++ library. And if you try to link uh, both together, it will produce link errors. At least there are, there are, they are link errors. They are much easier and to handle but uh, you have the problems when you are building and you detect an incompatibility, and it's not a matter that you just upgrade the compiler. You upgrade the compiler in an old distro of Linux, and it won't update the standard library. It will, it will keep the old library. But if you update the compiler in a modern distro, it will update the, the standard library. So this is a huge pain, and it's something that, that has to be dealt with. So this is uh, something I read in, in a blog post. Uh, someone, he was complaining that he had to refactor like a huge project of 27,000 lines of code. So I, I quickly ran a survey uh, on Twitter, not very statistically significant, 
But uh, the community just say that, okay, huge is something starting with 10 million lines of code of C++. Okay? So we definitely have to, to deal with huge uh, code bases. And those code bases will, will compile for, for hours if we, if we have to, to build from, from sources again and again. So it's something that, that we, can, we, cannot, we cannot simply do. Uh, other package managers for those uh, very trendy and cool modern languages like Rust and Go, they, they don't have the ABI compatibility problem because they always build from sources. The thing that, that, that they, they haven't scaled to, to our C++ projects, they are still small enough and they can manage. But, but we can because our projects, are, our projects are huge. So we really need to manage the binaries and we have to live with the ABI incompatibility problems. So what, what uh, have we been doing in the, in the last uh, decades? So if we were able to work in a single platform like Linux, you can just use apt-get, for example, and, and, and uh, get the packages, and, and it will be fine for open source packages. But the truth is that we also, also have dependencies and want to have packages ourselves in our companies because uh, we have different products, we have different teams, and we want to reuse code. So what every C++ company in the world has been doing, they have been just uh, reinventing the wheel. And every single company has run, the, run uh, their own solutions with uh, legacy build systems, uh, in-house build, build systems. Like abusing CMake is something that I really hate, but a lot of people just use CMake to download and unzip and do kind of uh, dependency management. Uh, that for me is a pain. You, you end with huge CMake scripts that are unmaintainable. Um, and what we saw when we were uh, talking to many companies, we realized two things. First, most of them were using Python. For, for developing their own dev tools, Python is a very loved language for, for us to, to develop our own build tools. And we all wanted on-premises. So having on-premises is a very important thing for us because we, we are developing like critical infrastructure. So, so the NPM, uh, the vehicle of the left pad we uh, removed from NPM central repository is something that won't happen to us because we won't rely on such an external repository as heavily as the, as the node and, and web develop, developers. So uh, solutions has to be really on-premises. So but these custom solutions and these proprietary solutions in our companies are not enough. Uh, if, they, if they were all the other languages, they wouldn't have their own language package managers. And they, all of them, they have rolled their own because it's really something we need as developers. So let me introduce uh, Conan. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to, to talk about the former governor of California, uh, wearing a, a, a sword, but I'm going to talk about something even cooler. This is Conan C and C++ package manager. It is a package manager, uh, full open source with MIT license, so very permissive. It is portable. It can run in any system. You can run Python. Uh, you can run uh, Conan. So actually, we, we have support for other uh, for all operating systems like Windows, Linux, Mac, and it's also used in FreeBSD and Solaris on uh, SunOS. And if you don't have support for that platform because you are doing embedded or whatever, you can do cross build. Okay. It is based on Python. We are using Python everywhere, and, uh, and the way to construct packages is, is building py Python recipes, because it's very convenient, because it's the thing we were doing before Conan was there. Uh, it handles binaries from the very beginning, because we, we knew that it's necessary. But it, it also implements the, the whole cycle from building the packages from source if you want to. So you get the reproducibility we want to get the binaries, not by hand, but automated in the process of using Conan. And of course, it is decentralized because we don't want to rely on, on a central repository. We, we want to have our own repositories in-house to be safe. Um, the Conan uh, implements the typical dependency management, so things like transitive dependencies, dependency uh, conflict resolution, dependency overriding, also for options. If you have a conflict of uh, some package is, is depending on a static library, and in the other diamond branch, you depend on the dynamic library, that would be a conflict too. So it can be re uh, resolved. You have uh, semantic versioning, you have version ranges, and you also have downstream propagation of configuration that upper upstream packages, they can uh, configure uh, things for the packages that are consuming them. So it's very useful for uh, something that we'll see later. 
So uh, this is the basic architecture of Conan. We have a, a client side tool that you can, a command line, you can type commands. And you have several servers that are used for storage, for the storage of the artifacts. We have a, an open source one, it's, it's called Conan Server. We have a, a JFrog Artifactory, okay, that is, is the solution used in, in the companies to scale to, to big teams. And we have also Conan.io, that is the central public repository. But as Slomi introduced, uh, it's going to be replaced by Bintray. Okay, Bintray is much feature-rich, uh, a lot of security, scalability, and everything. So we are getting rid of, Conan, of the old Conan.io and moving to Bintray. It's going to be a huge step forward to, to really distribute, especially open source, to the world. So one of the keys with, uh, in Conan is that you, you have this structure. You have a, a, reci a recipe, a package recipe, is a Python script. It's the Conan file Python script. Okay, but with that script for a given library, you can build any number of, of package binaries. So for example, if you are building for 64 bits architecture, you will get one binary. If you are building for 32 bits architecture, you will get a different binary, and so on. For uh, build types, for any uh, static dynamic libraries, you can have as many package binaries as, as you want. And all of them, they are linked, they are connected to the recipe that created them. Okay, so everything, is, is, is managed uh, in, in the same way. So for example, if you are uh, developing in your own machine and you create two binaries, you can just upload them and share with your team in this way. And you will put them in Artifactory and your team will be able to reuse those binaries from Artifactory and they, they won't need to, to build the binaries again, again themselves. This process can be scaled uh, to different operating systems. So you can have, for example, continuous integration slaves in Windows, in Linux, and each one will, will generate binaries for its own operating system. And then you will upload all of them to the same server, in this case, Artifactory. And in Artifactory, you will be able to manage all the binaries for all your platforms, all together in the same place. So you need to have an AppGate to manage your packages for, for Linux, and then NuGet to manage your, your binaries for Windows. All of them, irrespective of the platform, will be in the same place. Then, when your developers on your, or you are going to, to release a final product, uh, you, you, will, you, will, you will use those packages and you will link your, your final product using those packages. And this process is efficient because when you are installing in a developer machine or in a continuous integration to create the final package, you will first get the recipe. And if you are building for Windows, you will only get the binary artifacts you need to. For example, if you have in the server, you have debug and release artifacts, it's a typical fl flow is that you only want to integrate in the final product the release artifacts because you don't want to leak your debug artifacts because they can be decompiled and it's a security. So you can have your binaries, debug and release manage, and then you know that for your final integration, you can only use release. Okay, and only the release binaries, they will be downloaded and linked in your application. With this, we, we can implement the, uh, a full DevOps uh, um, system. So you can, in your, you can be working and, and in your Git and then push something to, to your GitHub server or your Git server in a case. And this can fire a job in Jenkins. Because with the Artifactory plugin uh, for Jenkins, there is integration also for Conan, uh, for Conan Package Manager. There is a DSL that implements, we will see it later, that, that implements the typical Conan functions. So it's very convenient to implement your jobs in Jenkins to create packages, for example, or to test your projects consuming Conan packages that are stored in Artifactory. And then finally, when you create your project or your packages, you can push them to Artifactory or, or to Bintray, of course, to distribute to the world. Finally, when you have your artifacts there in, in Artifactory and Bintray, developers or even other continuous integration uh, systems can pull them and can integrate them in, into their releases or into their development workflows. So now I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to, to do a, a quick introduction to Conan, but with a live demo. Okay, so. First, uh, I would like to introduce the, the, the way that Conan uses to, to uh, consume existing packages. Okay, so I'm going to, run an example that is going to use two libraries. I'm going to show you this source code. 
here is just a main application, okay, and with two uh, libraries. It, it is depending on Poco and Boost. For Boost, it's going to use Boost to, uh, use a, to implement a regex expression to, to parse emails. And for Poco, it's going to compute an MD5 hash. Actually, we will see how this computer uh, is, is, is actually, who is actually doing the computation, okay? So here I have this, this CPP file I want to build, so I need Boost and I need Poco to build. So let me show you what I need to do. So I'm going to write a Conan file dot text file, okay, with two things. The first one is the requirements. I'm declaring there that I want to depend on boost 1660 and I want to depend on boost 172, right? And now I have a different section, it's called the generators section. And I say CMake. What is this for? Uh, Conan decouples the build systems uh, from the package management. In this case, you have Boost and you have Poco. They can, build with, uh, they can be built with any build system. For example, Boost is, is built with uh, Boost Build, B2. It's a specific build system for Boost. And Poco is built with CMake and so on. But what I'm saying here is that I'm, my project is going to use CMake to consume these packages. Okay, so this is all I need to, to do. So I'm going to create a build folder I'm going to move to it. Let me just make sure it is clean. And I'm going to run Conan install. So the first thing I, I see when I run Conan install is that I'm getting not only boost and Poco, but also OpenSSL and setlib. Why? Let me show you Conan info graph file HTML. So here we can see that the, our project is requiring Boost and Poco. But it happens that Poco transitively depends on OpenSSL, and in turn, both Boost, both Boost and OpenSSL, they both depend on setlib. So when I did a Conan install, I got all the transitive dependencies to my system. Then I also got an interesting file. It's the conanbillinfo.cmake file. I'm going to have a quick look to show you. This is just a set of variables. These variables declare all the things that my build system requ requires to know about the dependencies. For example, the include directories. Here, you have the include di directories. Or the library names or the compiled definitions that the, my project needs to use to properly link with Boost and Poco. So this is a set of variables. So actually it's a large file, but it doesn't care. It's very explicit. It's just variables all the way. So I'm going to show you how the consumer project will, will use them. Okay, so this is the typical CMake stuff. Okay, you will declare the project. It will create an executable here from the source file. And all I need to do is to include the generated file because it declares all the variables I need. And then with those variables, I can do two things. I can use them myself if I can configure my build as I want, or I can just use a predefined macro that will do the, the job for me in 95% of the cases. If I want to do something special, maybe I don't want, I don't need, I don't want to, to use this macro, I will just uh, want to configure my build myself with the variables. But for most cases, this, this macro is, is good enough. And then, I can configure my project. Yeah, it's a bit slow, it's CMake on, on Windows, it's not very fast. Yeah, and now I can build my project. It's building demo. And here it is, demo running. The amazing thing about this is that I'm in Windows and I just go install Poco Boost Library. Those are two of the biggest C++ projects out there 
Also, OpenSSL, that is a pain to build in Windows, and setlib transitively, I'll just do it con and install. And I got my application, depending on, on, this, on these four things, very easily. Okay, so for me, in Windows, this is just a dream. Okay, now uh, I'm, I'm going to show you. Okay, so this is was very easy because you, you already had the packages there for Boost and Poco, so it's easy to make it work. So I'm going to show you how to create packages for, uh, for an existing library, for example. So here I have a GitHub project. Uh, it's a very simple one. It's just a Hello World library, okay, and with a CMake script that will build the library. This, the, the only thing I, I want to know you about this project is that it's not related to Conan at all. It's just a, a C++ project with a CMake script, okay, not related to Conan, with Conan at all. So what I need to to create a package from that library that is the source code that's in GitHub, I need a, a, what we call a package recipe. It's a Python script. It's that Conan file dot Python script. So, even if it's the first time you know about Conan, I'm pretty sure that you can understand this, this recipe. Okay? First, it has the name and the, and the version of the package. And then, this very important field is the settings field. Here, I'm declaring that if I change my operating system, the binary will be different. If I change my compiler, my binary will be different. If I change the build type, the binary will be different, and the architecture. Okay, so if I ch change any of those, the binary will be a different binary. Okay. Then I will have, they, they will, I will typically have four methods. The first one is the source one. The source one just declare uh, where my sources are. In this case, I'm just Git cloning them from GitHub. Okay, it's very simple. If you want to check out a specific branch, just do it in the indirect line or a specific tag. This is for, for building packages from external sources. If you want to just uh, check in and put your, your uh, package sources into the recipe itself, you can just skip the source function and use the export sources. The export sources will, will create a copy, copy the sources into the recipe. So it will be self-contained, and when you are creating the package, where you, you are building the package from sources, it will use the sources that are embedded in the package. Okay? So it's a different approach. Then you will have the build method. The build method is just wrapping any build system. So if you are using CMake, you, you will see here explicit calls to, to, to CMake. Actually, they can be automated, but yeah, I prefer to, to make them explicit to, to show how it's done. So for typical build systems like CMake, CMake or other tools, we have helpers like this one. This helper will just help us to translate the Conan settings into typical CMake variables. So it's just a helper that will help you. But if you want to do the translation yourself, it's very easy. Just create a common string for CMake that will call your CMake build. Okay? So the good thing about this is that you can uh, wrap any build system. If it's legacy or old one or unknown, you can just call it. Okay? So it is not coupled to the build system. Then the next method is the package method. So once you, uh, the build has created the, the artifacts, then you want to extract them to a, to a clean folder. This is what the package method does. It's typically just a copy of the headers and the libraries. It can be more complex, but typically it will be quite, quite simple. And finally, we will have the package information method. This is the equivalent to the Linux PC files, for example. It's something that is for consumers of the package. So here in this method, I'm declaring to my consumers that I'm going to implement a library, and that the library will be called hello. So the consumers already know that they have to link with a library that is called hello, and they don't have to guess. This is very convenient. For example, in many cases, if you are in, in Windows Visual Studio, that typically libraries in debug will, will uh, suffix a D, okay? and then your, your users, uh, your consumers have to figure out and add, add a D in their build scripts, they won't, because you will say here in package info, hey, my library, if I am in debug mode, my library is going to be named like this. And you can configure include directories, uh, library names, compile definitions, all the things we, we saw in the Conan build info, CMake file, all of them, they, they come from, from this, this method, okay? It's something for the consumers. It's the way to decouple uh, our build system 
either when we are calling it or either where we are transferring information to our consumers. So all I need to, to um, build my package is this, this uh, recipe here. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to call test package. And this will do the, the task for me. It is cloning the sources from GitHub. Okay, in this line. Now it is building. Uh, in this case, it is using my default that is Visual Studio for in. It has created the package. And now what it's doing is it's building a, a, a different project. This project is actually consuming the package that I just created. Why? Because if I create a package, I can, I can make many mistakes. I can forget to package the headers, for example. Or I, I can forget to, to package the, libra the libraries themselves. Or I can forget about uh, compile definition for my consumers. So I, when, I create a, when I create a package, I want to make sure that it's properly working. So the test pa package functionality will ensure that this package is fine because other test project is actually linking with it and is actually calling an application that is linking with a function of the package. And that will ensure that at least it links, it runs properly. Okay, so it's very convenient. So now, if I search in my computer local cache, I will see that I have this package recipe here. And I will see also that I have a binary for this uh, package recipe. In this case, the binary is going to be a 64 bits one release Visual Studio. Okay. The good thing about Conan is, uh, as I told you, it can manage many binaries. And building those binaries is as easy as providing a different configuration. So if I run test package and I specify, for example, a different architecture, I'm going to build my package for 32 bits. I just provide my configuration. In, in this case, the architecture is going to be x86, and it will repeat, repeat the process. It didn't have to git clone from GitHub again because it already did. In the local cache, we have the project already. And now it is it's building the package, the package binary for 32 bits is there, and now it is repeating the consuming pr uh, project, and it's using the consuming project again to make sure that the package for 32 bits is, is also working. So if we check now our local cache, now we have two binaries. And we will see that we have a binary for 32 bits, and we have a binary for 64 bits. Okay? This process can also be extended, for example, For course building, uh, you, you check that I, I typed in the command line architecture uh, uh, x86, okay? But what happens if I want to cross build to Raspberry Pi? I have to specify Linux uh, operating system, GCC, 4.6, uh, the library, debug, uh, a different architecture, and I also have to define my, my cross compiler. In this case, I can use environment variables to define the cross-compiler that I'm using in Windows to cross-compile to, to Linux. So this is just a text file, a text file that you can put in a repo and you can share with your team with, all the, uh, with a, uh, the typical configuration for your target platforms. And you will have a set of, pro of profiles to build as many targets as, as you want. With the profiles, you can just provide the the profile name. Now here we see that it's using the cross compiler to cross build. And now it is also using the consumer project to check that the, that the, that the package is properly created. The only thing that I'm not doing here is I'm not running the application because it won't run. Okay? But otherwise, I'm at least testing that I'm able to link properly with the package then I will need to transfer to the Raspberry Pi, of course, for, for testing the actual application. So if I search my package here, I will now have three binaries. I will have the 32, 64, and also the Raspberry Pi one. So this is the process to, uh, of creating packages locally in my machine or in a continuous integration slave. But now these, these binaries are, are good, we want to share with the team, so I have to put them somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my packages, and I'm going to do, is do it using Artifactory. So in Artifactory, I can create a kernel repository very easily. Oh. 
Mm. Wow. Yeah. So I will select a Conan repository. I will give a name. Okay, and I will have my empty repository. And now, uh, setting it up is very easy. I just need the URL of the repository. And I told you that Conan is decentralized. So if I check my remote, it's exactly the same as Git. As Git. It's the same model. So right now, I only had one uh, repository and one remote. And I'm going to add Conan remote, add Artifactory, and then the URL that Artifactory gave me. Okay, and then uh, to share with the team, I can just Conan upload all the packages that matches this pattern. I'm going to upload them to Artifactory. And I want to upload not only the package recipes, but all the binaries that are in my computer, all of them, they will be uploaded to Artifactory. Uh, do you want to upload? Yes, I want. Okay, now let's go and check it. And here I have the three binaries for the three different configurations, okay? And now from there they are ready to use for my team. So my team can just pull them exactly as I did with the boost poke example. They will run Conan install and they will get the binary they need for the system to work. So this, uh, so far this is, uh, this is uh, very cool. So we can go uh, one step further and we can automate in Jenkins, okay? So we have here the Jenkins. So I'm going to create a new, oh, again, timeouts. Ah. Okay, so I'm going to create a hello package job. I'm going to select the pipeline. And the good thing is that the Artifactory plugin for, uh, for Jenkins, it has a, a very useful DSL. And the DSL will allow me to, to define things. For example, of course, the Git cloning of the recipe I want to, I want to build, but it will have uh, accessors to access the server. I can instance a client here. With the client, I can uh, get the server name and the server name will be configuration in Jenkins. So for example, in this case, I, I don't need to put my user and password explicitly in, in, in text because the plugin will, will handle it for me. Okay. So uh, with this uh, DSL, with this pipeline here, I'm just going to take a, a sample recipe, create a package. This will be the test create and test the package, and then with that package, I will upload it to Artifactory automatically. So all I need to do is take this pipeline here, okay, save, and let's fire, uh, sorry, ah, I did. So it got the recipe, it configured everything, now it's building the package itself, testing the package. And finally, uploading the package to Artifactory. Okay, everything looks good. So I can go to Artifactory, and I will check, actually the user that I'm using is a different one. To, 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 so you see that actually a different package for, the, for Hello is being uploaded. So here we have the package and that package is already uh, ready to be used for, by my team and it was created by, by uh, Jenkins. Okay, so um, this, what I've shown here is, is just a, 
a small part of, of uh, the whole thing, but of course, uh, 45 minutes is not enough to, to solve every part of it. But for example, I, I would like to highlight some, some of the interesting features that can, Conan can, can provide. Uh, for example, it can provide any custom settings. The settings, uh, you can define your own settings for your own targets, uh, architectures, compilers, and everything, and you can use them and manage your binaries that matches those settings. Uh, you can also have a very interesting features like build requirements. Build requirements, you can actually, there are actually there are, there are Conan users that are doing so. They are managing their dev tools as Conan packages. So they will create a, a Conan package for CMake for the different versions, and they will upload the, the CMake package uh, to Artifactory. And then packages that need CMake to build can declare a build requirement to CMake, to CMake, so only if that package need to be built from sources, it will pull CMake and it will use CMake, okay? And the specific CMake version you, you want. So you can manage your, your own, uh, your full uh, dev, uh, dev tool stack uh, in Conan. Uh, a very cool example we have in the docs is how to cross build to Android uh, using build requires. So Luis here they created an, an Android NDK, NDK uh, package, okay? And you can have libraries li like setlib or libpng that th they were created and they don't have anything, any reference at all to Android. And you can just declare a build requirement, pull the Android NDK, inject the settings into the package recipe so the package recipe is cross-built to Android transparently. And this is a, a very, very cool feature. Uh, and of course, I've, thought, I've talked about the ABI incompatibility issues. You have full control over, the, over it. There is a package ID method in the recipes. You can do any crazy thing you want about the compatibility, you can define it there. And of course, we uh, implement many different packaging paradigms. You can have multi-configuration packages. You can have a single package, a single build, and package many times. So you can do different, different packages, packaging approaches. So uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk uh, saying that uh, I've presented a, a modern DevOps for C, C and C++. Uh, Conan Package Manager uh, is very useful for, for implementing the, this, this tool. And of course, with J4 Artifactory and uh, Jenkins Continuing Integration and the plugin, it's very convenient to automatically create packages in our continuous integration. And finally, I didn't have time enough, but if you want to distribute your, your packages, your Conan Packages to the world, now, from today, you can do it in Bintray. And you can do it either for open source in the public or for in, in private for your customers using Bintray uh, premium services. So it's the, a very good way. Uh, if you are interested, for example, there is a parallel talk right now by, by Ankus that he's uh, doing microservices with uh, full uh, continuous integration with Docker, OpenShift, and so And he's using Conan. So he's able to create and deploy an application created with Conan, depending on Boost and Poco, in one single line. Okay, so I've presented the basics. With these basics, you can go all the way to do crazy DevOps uh, stuff uh, with no limit. So finally, I, I would like to uh, conclude. I, I was trying to make a, like a cool infographics with all the logos and everything, but finally I gave up. So uh, I would like to conclude that uh, we have a Conan here that is, is in a very healthy state. We, we got like uh, almost 1,000 stars in GitHub. We have like 52 contributors to the open source. It is being used by many, many companies in production right now. So I would say uh, it's an amazing tool. If you take it and you put it together with a JFrog Artifactory, JFrog Bean Tray, uh, Jenkins plugin and everything, you will finally get something incredible. We will get Modern DevOps for C and C++ projects. So thanks very much for your attention. And now, uh, yeah, please don't forget to, to submit uh, feedback, either with the uh, sked.com uh, application or with the papers you have on the table. And if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, over there. What are the uh, implications of using Conan with static linking versus dynamic linking? Uh, sorry, what, what are the implications of Conan with? D static linking versus dynamic linking. 
Yeah, uh, so if you want to implement a static or dynamic uh, linking, uh, you would typically use options. Options is something that packages can, can, can default, can define. So um, you will have uh, like uh, the boost package itself, you have the static and dynamic option. And the consumers will say, okay, so I want to uh, depend on boost and I want to do it as a static library. Or I can do it, I, I want to do it as a dynamic library. And the package will provide the artifacts for st either static or dynamic. So it's, not, it's something, of course, that the package creators, they have to implement if they want. So, so you're basically saying during the early part of the development life, life cycle, you know, switch it to dynamic, and then if you wanted to ship it static, then you'd, you'd switch it as an option, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so you could develop the, the hello uh, package I developed is just for static libraries, okay? So a typical workflow, okay, so I'm, going, I'm using the hello package as a static library. If you want to use as a static library, you will typically go to your build system, uh, say, okay, this is also uh, dynamic, add an option to your package recipe, and then your consumers will be able to define, okay, I want to use hello as a static library, or I want to use hello as a dynamic library, and you will get the, the artifact you, you need. Yeah, I, I was thinking more of a complex system where they want to publish stuff back up into uh, the dependency management system and then consume it. Uh, I, I deal with teams that, um, you know, will, will, will want to deliver a really complex application with many dependencies, and they, they have all this code and they're statically linking it. I want to break it up and put it into, you know, Artifactory. And, oh, and yeah. they say, well, I can't do that because I do static linking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I think I, I now I, I've already, yeah, so what happens? If you have a dependency graph, and then you have a static and dynamic or, or dynamic uh, linkage in, in that dependency graph, and you, for example, publish a new version or you, you, you overwrite a package, it happens that, that you might need to, to rebuild the, the, the other packages that are depending on that one, right? Depending if it is static or dynamic, okay? But that, that is something that uh, the, the continuous integration has to define. So Conan has tools to know about it. So you can, for example, say, okay, so if I modify this package, which other packages will be affected? And you will, and you will know. Uh, so you, you, you are able to fire a rebuild of the dependent, pa of the dependent packages if you know that that, that has changed. But there is, there is a, an article on the Conan blog that uh, treats this, this a little bit because there is a huge variability of, of those things. It's not only static or dynamic. What happens if you have header-only libraries? Those header only libraries can be used by other headers or they can be embedded in the sources of other, other packages that are consuming them. If they are embedded and you are publishing a new version of a header only library, you are, uh, it is compulsory that you rebuild the consumer packages because you are embedding the sources. Uh, and you can only know uh, by your topology what, but what you are doing in your, in your project. So if you are doing all libraries and you are, sorry, all uh, dynamic libraries, and you are not changing the API, you don't need to rebuild anything. If you are doing all static libraries, you only need to, to uh, rebuild the final binary, the final executable that you are, that you are uh, linking. So it depends on your topology of your dependencies and, and your approach to, to uh, library ma management. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Other question? Um, you mentioned that you can uh, um, build, package your development tools, like you mentioned CMake, for instance. Um, so I assume your cross compiler that you show was pre-installed, but you could package it. Um, but my question would be like, if I build CMake, then CMake may depend on a dynamic library that were installed on the system I compiled it. So you have to rebuild transitively all the dependency of, of CMake, for instance. Yeah. Uh, uh, and on package them as well. Yeah, you have to build the full distribution, basically, the full Linux distribution package management again. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, the thing with, if you need to, to rebuild CMake, for example, and CMake has transitive dependencies, they will be also managed. So if you are building CMake, it will, be, it will build CMake, also the dependencies, and then it will inject all of the dependency tree of CMake, e even the, the dynamic libraries uh, path, it, it will put the path of the dynamic, dynamic libraries into the consumer library so it's able to make CMake work even if it a, has dependencies to other packages with dynamic libraries. So it will be, the build requirements will be an independent, complete uh, 
dependency graph for the, for the build requirements. Okay, and, and now if I package my CMake on, I don't know, Ubuntu 16, and my developer are using a Fedora, an old Fedora, like there can be libc uh, discrepancies or things like that? that yeah, 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 we have uh, users in company production right now that they are not using any tool of the, of the full stack uh, pre-build. So they are building CMake, they are building their compilers, they are building everything uh, they need to, to recreate the full System. So they are managing all of it with Conan. See, make the compilers and everything. So yeah, actually they were doing also cross-building to Android and iOS before we provided the, the build requirements. So yeah, can be done, no problem. So um, what you seem to be suggesting is that there's a parallel dependency management from the native OS packages and the Conan packages. So your example with Zlib, uh, you would have a Zlib that you go and build as part of Conan, which is completely independent than the base OS, and you would have to go and manage installing it in some, you know, if it was a shared library, some part as your deployment of your application so yeah. it didn't interfere with the system library. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Uh, when you have libraries that can be either on Conan on, or the operating system, you have to choose. So if you decide to, to manage the library yourself, it will be a Conan package and it will be under your control. And, and if there is a security release, you will have to manage to, to update the Conan package and depend on the new up patched version of the Conan package. Or you can depend on the system one if you want. We are not forcing anyone to use the OpenSSL from, from Conan or set it from Conan. What you can easily do is, is uh, recipes and packages, uh, you can change them. So you can have a package for setlib, for example, from sources, and you can have just a wrapper to the operating system installed uh, setlib. And uh, that recipe will just, for example, call apt get to be sure that setlib system is there and link with it. So you can change both if you want. Yeah, okay, so now I want to use the Conan one or I want to use the system one, and you can change between them. How are people using uh, semantic versioning with internally versioned libraries that they create at their companies? Uh, one of the problems we've run into is uh, with our locally developed libraries, uh, we want to be able to always get the latest, but we always find that we're explicitly calling them out by, by version number. How are other companies getting around that? How are they just getting what is the latest built on their master branch? <sighs> Uh, I wouldn't say there is a, a, just a single answer to that. Uh, I say that every company, they are using different uh, versioning uh, schemes. Uh, many of them, they will try just to be on the head and, and, and keep the latest version and uh, like continuous overriding the, the latest version and try to keep the other will be very strict with the, with the versions and they will have uh, their own versioning scheme. And yeah, Conan supports semantic versioning, so you can use the 1.0.2, and you can use even version ranges to, to match a, a range of, of matching versions. Like uh, yeah, if you use version ranges and you put the, the version you depend on uh, with brackets, that means uh, semantic versioning, and you can use any, any expression like uh, greater than, lower than, uh, approximately that, that will use the latest patch from, from that family. Of. Yeah, I'm not, I, actually, version ranges uh, is not, uh, it is used, but not hugely used, because in C++, what uh, we have learned is that people just fix to a version. I'm going to use this version always, and if I'm going to patch something, I want an explicit upgrade to that dependency. So I don't want semantic versioning or version ranges to act Update for me. I will do it explicitly. I will go there and uh, type the latest patch of the of the version. Yeah. You're welcome. I think we are done, time-wise. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming.